the Zebco Sportsman with Homer Circle, well-known outdoorsman and angling editor of Sports of Field magazine. Hello, everybody. Our topic for this session is going to be camouflaging, the way most wild creatures outsmart hunters and survive. We'll be back right after this message. Well, let's talk about how to be almost invisible outdoors. All good wildlife photographers and expert hunters have learned through observation that wild creatures avoid detection in two common ways. One, by their natural coloration, which blends with their habitat, and two, through concealment or immobility. Because of this, we can walk past dozens of animals during a stroll through the woods or fields. Now, an animal as large as a buck deer, when surprised, often freezes all motion, but its eyes, ears, and nose remain alert. Its legs blend with the surrounding weeds and saplings, while antlers match the irregularity of tree branches. And, unless threatened, the buck will remain motionless until we have walked out of sight or indicated that we have discovered it. Thus, the buck has used both tricks of the wild, camouflaging and immobility. Then take wild birds. Most hens are drably colored, while the male birds are the gaily colored ones. Here again, there's a purpose. Because of her dull-hued plumage, the hen is virtually invisible while sitting on a nest, either hatching eggs or protecting her young. And should danger approach, the highly colored cockbird often flies up or dashes away from the nest in order to decoy whatever it is it threatens. The foregoing is meant to illustrate one very important point. Whether you are a hunter, photographer, nature lover, bird watcher, or just curious about our wild creatures. If you would see more game, you've got to play the game of camouflage. For example, take the bow hunter. He wears camouflage clothing and may darken his face and hands to eliminate reflection of these light surfaces. Even the bows have a camouflage cover or coloration. And of course, stealth plays a very important part in the bow hunter's bag of tricks, together with his ability to remain motionless and quiet. Duck hunters spend weeks ahead of the season building their blinds and disguising them with grass, bushes, cattails, trees, or whatever it takes to make them blend with the background around them. And just what does all the foregoing prove? Well, fellow outdoorsmen, we've been pointing out the values of observation in the outdoors, learning from the creatures who live there and die unless they master the tricks of camouflage and immobility. So, whether you're a hunter, a wildlife enthusiast, a photographer, or just a person who likes to observe nature as it is when man isn't around, we suggest you dress yourself in camouflage clothing from head to toe, walk quietly into a forest, and remain motionless for a half an hour or so. It could be one of the most rewarding experiences of your life, especially if you have a camera with a telephoto lens and can show others what you saw that most observers would not have seen. Well. Time's up, and it's so long until next time. This has been the Zebco Sportsman with Homer Circle, who reminds you it takes good equipment to be a good sportsman. All-purpose fishing clothes. The Zebco Sportsman with Homer Circle, well-known outdoorsman and angling editor of Sports of Field magazine. Hello, everyone. This visit, we're going to talk about all-purpose fishing clothes and how it can benefit you. We'll be back right after this message. Well, we're going to talk about all-purpose fishing clothes and the thoughts just might surprise a lot of fishermen who think any old clothes will do it. Well, sure they will, but not with the safety and comfort I have in mind. When a fisherman is properly garbed, he's prepared for any type of weather or emergency. Let's break our topic into two segments, cold weather fishing and warm weather fishing, and we'll delve into the duds that do the best job for each situation. Now, in cold weather, I use the layer system. Next to my hide goes medium weight, loose knit thermal underwear. You know, the kind that looks like a waffle. Well, this holds heat, but also breeze should the weather warm up. A wool shirt and pants form the next layer, topped by a loose knit sweater. And over the sweater, I wear a flotation jacket. 
Now this flotation jacket is a space age product, a far cry from the bulky unsightly life vests of yesteryear. They look like a stylish jacket, act as a windbreaker to keep in body warmth, and are lined with a soft, lightweight, cellular foam which will keep you afloat should you fall overboard. Then to keep my feet happy, I wear insulated socks and a pair of Oxfords. In extremely cold weather, these are topped by a pair of loose-fitting, shirling line galoshes that can be shucked in an emergency. Now on my head is a hat or a cap with ear flaps. These can be mighty comforting while running fast or bracing into a cold wind early and late in the day. And for temperatures near or below freezing, I carry in my coat pocket a knit ski mask which covers the face except for openings for the mouth and eyes. Now hands can be kept reasonably warm with gloves that have the fingertips cut off. Should these prove inadequate and you develop frigid digits, a bucket of glowing charcoal or a catalytic heater like a Zebco Traveler, for example, makes a great instantaneous hand warmer. Now let's discuss dressing for warm weather. This is a matter of comfort, freedom, and protection from excessive sun. As to the proper color of clothing, I don't believe this makes a smidgen of difference to fish or fishermen. Lightness and looseness are the requisites. My preference is an all-purpose one-piece garment called by various names such as leisure alls, jumpsuits, loungers, and so forth. My wife refers to mine as rompers. Now these are no iron material, hand washable, and two pairs can keep me going indefinitely on extended fishing trips. Well, the rest of it is a hat or cap that keeps the head cool and eyes shaded, polarized sunglasses to reduce glare, suntan lotion to minimize burn, an insect repellent to ward off biting pests. These round out the necessities. And finally, take an insulated container with cold beverages to maintain your fluid balance, plus salt tablets when you perspire excessively. This will add to your comfort in very hot weather. The main thing is, know what it takes to keep you comfortable and safe, and stay with it. With well, the clock says time's up, and it's so long until our next visit. This has been the Zebco Sportsman with Homer Circle, who reminds you it takes good equipment to be a good sportsman. Electronic fishing aids for the angler. It's the Zebco Sportsman with Homer Circle, well-known outdoorsman and angling editor of Sports of Field magazine. Hello, everyone. Our topic for this visit is electronic fishing aids for the angler. How modern fishing equipment helps you catch more fish. More in a moment, but first this message. Well, let's talk about how electronic fishing aids help today's anglers catch more fish. You know in this push-button age of powerized gadgets, a fisherman never had it so good. He eases into his boat seat, pushes a button, and nudges a growling inboard or outboard motor into readiness. Another lever elevates his motor to give his boat the best trim as he heads for quiet, uncrowded waters. And then arriving at his destination, he mutes the big engine and quietly eases overboard a compact electric fishing motor powered by tiny permanent magnets. It has a number of operating speeds to fit all of his needs. And as he moves along a shoreline, he turns on his electronic depth indicator. Cat quiet, the electric motor sneaks him into a small bay. The dial on his depth indicator tells him precisely where the drop-off is. And depending on the species of fish he plans to catch, he must know at what depth the temperature is most compatible. For this information, he calls on a compact electric thermometer. A sensor is lowered on a flexible insulated wire, which is marked off in feet. Quickly, he correlates the temperature and the depth where his chances are best to catch a fish. He then selects a lure to reach the indicated depth and he fishes it with confidence instead of guesswork. Well, after he catches the available fish there, he decides to try for other species in other places. That quiet bay across the lake where a stream enters looks mighty promising. So he scats quickly to the mouth of it to size up the situation. Knowing that the larger fish will be near the meandering bed of the stream, he would be totally ignorant of the course of that stream bed were it not for his depth indicator. He just flicks it on and by noting the readings, he traces the stream's curves and pinpoints a large, deep hole where the bottom reads 30 feet in depth. 
He then selects a lure that he can work at 28 feet, just over the bottom, and a few more fish are added to his stringer. Now with the sun high in the sky, he knows the fish are moving into the deeper mid-lake waters around shoals that are invisible to the human eye, but not invisible to the electronic eye of his depth indicator. Closely watching its dial, he not only locates two shoals about 100 feet apart, but he also notices that a reef connects the two, and the reef is dotted with brush, an ideal area for many species of fish. You see, brush is where the minnows hide, so that's where the big fish hang out. His dial tells him the brush is 18 feet deep, so he fishes just over it at 17 feet, and he catches the rest of his limit for the day. As dusk approaches, he turns on his red and green running lights with a spotlight to illuminate questionable areas. And back at the dock, he plugs in an electric fish scaler and makes short work of an otherwise tedious job. No doubt about it, his entire day has been made more complete, more productive, and more enjoyable because of all the powerized gadgets now available for the fishermen. Well, time's up, and we'll say so long until our next visit. This has been the Zebco Sportsman with Homer Circle, who reminds you it takes good equipment to be a good sportsman. should fishing equipment last? It's the Zebco Sportsman with Homer Circle, well-known outdoorsman and angling editor of Sports of Field magazine. Hello, everybody. On a recent fishing trip, we were talking about fishing tackle, and the question came up, how long should fishing tackle last? And I thought the results might be interesting. We'll be back right after this message. Well, let's talk about how long should fishing tackle last. You know, I know a man who's very rough on tackle and uses a rod or reel till it quits and then just buys another one. He says he doesn't have time to take it back for repairs. Well, of course, that's one man's opinion. But I noticed that his equipment was middle to low quality, and in my humble opinion, he's asking for trouble at a time when he might be tied to the biggest fish he's ever hooked. If a rod or reel malfunctions at the crucial moment of the battle, he simply lost his fish, that's all. I believe in buying the very best tackle you can afford, and then giving it the very best of care. Too many fishermen believe a rod or reel should last forever, no matter how little it's cared for. Well, this is neither sensible nor fair. In fact, it's just as logical to say your automobile should perform perfectly without adding or changing oil, lubricating it, or giving it a motor tune-up from time to time. The main malfunction of a fishing rod is for it to break, and yet it's almost impossible to break a rod while it's being used to land a fish. On a straight pull and a normal bend, you'll tear off the guys before the rod will break. Most rods are broken in a car or screen door, or being stepped on, or in the case of tubular glass, by striking a sharp object like a boat gunnel or outboard motor. About the only care reels need is an occasional cleaning and lubricating. But if the reel is of complex construction, don't try repairing it yourself. Most of our better reel makers have repair stations near you and their service is fast, except during extra busy periods like early spring. Now about lures. They will last longer than you can keep them normally. Snags claim the greatest toll, of course but lures do require care to keep them working properly. Hollow plastic plugs get punctures from toothy fish like pike or muscalunge and must be repaired. A little dab of household cement will do it. Metal lures take care also, or their lives will be short. They should be cleaned periodically to prevent rust and kept away from insecticides and plastic worms. These have corrosive elements. Above all, keep your hook points sharp. Now, so far as lines are concerned, there isn't much you can do about preserving these. Just test them from time to time to make sure they are strong enough to do the job. For example, monofilament line can deteriorate from one season to the next, so replace this at least once a year. And should a rod, reel, or line malfunction for you, don't hesitate to send it back to the manufacturer. But when you do, write a letter telling exactly what happened, how long you've had the item, and what you expect in the way of an adjustment. Be fair and you'll find the tackle maker also will be fair. 
Fishing tackle cannot be expected to last forever, but with reasonable care, it will last most of a lifetime, especially if it's of fine quality. So buy the best you can afford and take good care of it. Well, time's up, and it's so long till the next visit. This has been the Zebco Sportsman with Homer Circle, who reminds you it takes good equipment to be a good sportsman. Smallmouth Hot Spots. It's the Zebco Sportsman with Homer Circle, well-known outdoorsman and angling editor of Sports of Field magazine. Hello everyone. Our topic for this visit is going to be smallmouth hotspots with tips on where to catch these bronze beauties. More in a moment, but first this message. Let's talk about one of our truly outstanding sport fishes, the smallmouth bass. Anyone who has caught smallmouth will readily agree with the pioneer naturalist, Dr. James Henschel, who said, pound for pound, inch for inch, the greatest game fish that swims. You know, if you're lucky enough to live where there's good smallmouth bass fishing, you are blessed among fishermen. And if there are no smallmouth bass in your area, then perhaps some of the places we're going to discuss will be no more than a vacation jaunt away or perhaps a weekend trip will do it. In my job, I must do a certain number of smallmouth stories every year, so I'm constantly in touch with new hot spots as they develop. And I usually sample the fishing at intervals to be able to accurately predict when and where the fishing is going to be in full bloom. And this is so I can advise fishermen across the nation where the currently best smallmouth areas are and when the odds are most favorable for going there. First off, Let's talk about where the nation's biggest smallmouth bass come from. Well, it's the same place the present world record of 11 pounds, 15 ounces came from, Dale Hollow Lake in Tennessee and Kentucky. This is a beautiful clearwater lake, and although you won't catch smallmouth bass each time out, I believe a vacation trip should produce enough fish to make it worth the time and effort. Another hot spot is below the dams in Alabama's fast-flowing rivers. Fishing is exciting because you have to be alert when playing one of these roughnecks in swiftly moving current. One mistake and you'll lose a fish to a snag or a big bruiser will leap high into the ozone and toss your lure right back at you as it puts up a frenzied fight for freedom. This kind of action calls for a dependable drag on your reel, like that on a Zebco 800, for example. Now let's hop to the far north country to Minnesota's famed Lake of the Woods area. You'll find smaller average size smallmouth here, but you'll catch more of them per hour than any comparable area I know. Rocky shores dotted by huge boulders make ideal hiding and feeding spots for these hardy thoroughbreds, and fish taste mighty fine from these cold, crisp waters. Another smallmouth bonanza awaits you in Wisconsin's spring-fed lakes and flowages. The biggest fish are caught late in April or early in May, about when spring is busting loose but fall fishing also can be mighty productive. In Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Missouri have some of the most enjoyable float trips I've experienced. Here, smallmouth are found in rivers that course their ways through breathtakingly beautiful country. And you've never eaten tastier fish than those broiled over a rosy bed of hardwood coals at an overnight camp. Here, you get in your licks during the two best fishing times of day, first light and first dark. And Washington Snake River is fast becoming known for its huge smallmouth bass up to eight pounds plus. And something about the richness of this river has proved to be ideal smallmouth environment, and they're growing like mushrooms. Well, to get the latest information on all these hot spots, write to the state fish and game departments of each state mentioned. Address it to the state capitol. Ask for smallmouth fishing data, and you'll get the latest information available. Well, time's up and we'll say so long until our next visit. This has been the Zebco Sportsman with Homer Circle, who reminds you it takes good equipment to be a good sportsman.